Gadget UK here again, just following on from the previous two videos, we had an MV1A and an MV1AX. Uh, the, uh, one, the AX was the one with the BIOS, uh, that's the other board actually. Um, I was going to relocate the wires, so we'll cover that in this video. Um, there's a few other things as well. The, uh, we, it was one SM1 short, um, and the board that didn't have the SM1 was showing the same problems as the previous one, you know, it was coming up with uh, various things in the diagnostics there. And before I forget, there was also the Neo Buff. We relocated one from uh, the uh, the board with the BIOS problem to the other one uh, to fix uh, to fix that. So when we put that back into the GA11 spot, it was untested. Um, so I covered that in this video as well. And later on, I show a decap chip from Vertec, and I also in this video, I cover how to bypass the SM1 actually. So you can actually boot one of these boards without an SM1 chip at all. So yeah, there's no sound, it's coming up with an unexpected RQ now. You get that, or you've not got this chip here with the SM1. I know that from the previous video, actually, of experimentation, you know, testing without it. You will get that, and you'll get the same thing with a faulty M1, uh, SM1. Uh, I keep calling it the M1, it's the SM1. Um, so, yeah, the question is, should we be able to get any sound at all in games and things without that? I'm not sure. Um, I might just do a bit of research and report back. So the interesting thing, you'll note here that we get sound, and if we get sound, it's perfect, and it remains working all the time you've got it powered up. Yeah, it sounds perfect. I mean, it's come through an awful speaker. Switch it off and on, and there's a chance, more often than not, that you won't get sound. So this is the interesting behaviour with this one. But you saw, you see we've got sound, that's amazing. You saw in the diagnostics there that, uh, you know, it's reporting all sorts of errors again. Now bear in mind, it's not got an M1 ROM, the SM1, sorry, not M1, SM1, it's not got, there you go, no sound. More often than not, you'll get no sound. Uh, when you're on the diagnostics, obviously, like I say, it kicks off uh, about the uh, SM1 latch, it then says there's like unexpected RQ, and we get uh, you know a specific uh, mismatch there in the expected versus the actual um, communications channel again. So I'm, I do think it's it's going to be the uh, neo buff there to do with communication. I think it's just glitching. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, although you would think that it would glitch out whilst in use, you know, I can't understand why. Once you get communication, it continues to work. But in the first instance, I'm going to swap out the, uh, as I described, swap out the, the NeoBuff chip. I'll swap the one on the Z80 around with the one related to the controller ports. So I've got this set to about 420 degrees, actually. I found it quite optimal for these chips that have got, uh, you know, uh, pins around all four sides. The smaller ones you can go for somewhere between 300 and 350. 350 tends to be uh, an ideal temperature. See it freeing up there. I think we're pretty much there. There we go. So as I've mentioned before, go in the direction that the pads are on the board, you know, so the lengthways, they're, they're laid out this way. So we'll just clean up now, uh, cotton bud with some IPA, and uh, gently does it. Last thing I want to do is snag a, a trace or a pad and rip something off. So a little bit of flux on the desolder braid, and I'll try not blocking the shot. Wait till you reach temperature and drag it along, ow, 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 ow. This is where pliers uh, will help. If you drag the braid with pliers, you won't burn yourself, but uh, yeah, I'm accustomed to the heat. Yeah, that's not too bad. You see that, that's 
side that side done and it's just a case to go around all four sides uh, you can see there's lots of solder there on that top side but yeah all four sides very slowly what you don't want to do is attach the braid to the pin or press too hard and drag or bend the pins out of position yeah you don't want to do that and by the way I am wearing uh, an ESD wrist strap here as you can see normally actually a lot more often than not I'll stick this around my ankle because the place where I'm soldering here is just far easier uh, I also find that the bungee it restricts me too much when it's on my hand actually if I was working from a desk it might be a bit easier so again I'm covering things from the previous video but uh, anyway I need to go over it pin one marking is there you know the little notch in the bottom of the chip uh, and there's a dot there on the on the silk screen a little white dot and we've got one marked on the silk screen here so that's pin one so yeah it goes that way just need to make sure all four sides are aligned uh, anchor one corner you know solder one corner solder the other uh, I usually use the magnifier while I do this but it's a case of uh, as you can see dab into the pins here uh, and drag along as well you can drag like that you can see the flux makes light work of it so that didn't make any difference, the controllers are all okay, both controllers, all the buttons work in all directions and everything, and we've got the same issue where, you know, if you switch it off, switch it on, I would say there's something like a 10% chance you'll get sound, and the sound will be perfect, you won't have an issue, but if you soft reboot it in the Unibias, or you physically switch it off and on, you've lost sound again. Um, and it is, I'm sure, it is related to the uh, Z8 era, I think. Um, now we haven't got the SM1, could that be normal behaviour when you've not got an SM1? I'd find it hard to believe that sometimes you would get sound and sometimes you wouldn't. It's a bit strange. Um, I'm tempted to swap that Z80 because that Z80 um, had been swapped I think with the other board at some point. Um, so this may be the one that was on the other board that might have a glitch, I don't know. I've got a bunch of Z80s here anyway, including some of the you know new ones and stuff I've got. So I think we'll just swap that out anyway. Um, you know, this has turned into another chip swapping video here. Uh, I was hoping to have avoided that, but in general, the things we've learned, you know, the Z80 is obviously a factor. These two we've ruled out. Uh, the, the next thing is these two. Uh, that one came from a, the lower position, I think, on the other board. We swapped them around, but I've got replacements for these, so I could just swap those out and see if that solves it. But I would suggest, at the end of that, if we, once we swap the Z80 and swap those, if we're still getting the same behaviour, it must be something to do with it needed an SM1. Maybe I can do a mod. I did think about getting the uh, MV1C BIOS, and sticking that on here because that's designed not to test the Z80. So as a side note here I'd just like to give a special thanks to Furtec actually. Um, it was kind enough to send me this, can you see? It's a Neo GRC that has been decapped. I'll perhaps put a, a closer up uh, image or something over the top here, top right. But yeah it's thanks to uh, Furtec um, because he's reverse engineering the Neo Geo, that's been doing for a while now. Um, he's made some excellent progress. I think his aim is to replicate the Neo Geo entirely in FPGA cycle accurate. Um, and from the screenshots and updates and things he's been given, it looks like he's very close to achieving that actually. Um, but he, he's a major contributor to the Neo Geo Dev Wiki there. Um, so there's lots of tips and tricks and uh, the pinouts and things have all come from Furtec. Um, you know, things earlier in this video about the GA11 bypassing it and stuff, that's all uh, on there, uh, courtesy of Furtec. And Furtec has a Patreon page too, so uh, yeah, if you're a fan, uh, you know, of the Neo Geo stuff, please check out his Patreon page and consider giving him some support there. Uh, it costs quite a lot of money to decap these chips. So the other Z80 is just the same, and I'll just show you what we're getting. We're getting a run, well, it sort of toggles between C3AC and C353 which is uh, YM26101 unexpected RQ. This is exactly what we were seeing on the other board but with a slightly different code at some point there but we did, did, did have but we did have that YM26101 unexpected RQ. Um, so I'd expect a consistent behaviour but just watch we'll probably get the AC C3 AC that's different I did that twice in a row, let's just see if it follows the same pattern. Yeah, I'm going to swap the two 73s I think, I'll start with the top one. So a quick look at this board, I've put a question mark uh, on that one. 
and a question mark on that one. That came from the other board. In theory, it has a fault, but on this board, it seems to work okay. And I think it's because of direction, the direction that the data's traveling through that faulty gate on that chip, it's happy. It's only when it goes the other way, you've got an issue. Because uh, I think, I, ca I can't tell exactly where that's connected actually. I'm guessing it's gonna be something to do with the graphics. So if we had a problem there, it'd be visible. And I've not seen any issues at all. So, um, and that was definitely causing the problem on the other board. Um, interestingly enough, that's the one where you can, you can, you know, you can wire it out. I'll stick an image up here from the Neo Geo Dev Wiki. I think it was something Furtech provided. Uh, yeah, you can just use wires to replace that. So in theory, what you could do is if you've got one of those faulty somewhere else, you could take the one from here and put it onto, uh, you know, this area here, onto one of the places there. Uh, there's one there as well. I could swap that for something if I thought there was an issue, try and determine what's going on. But these here, he, well, certainly this one here, if anything, it's anything to do with program code and things like that, if you uh, have one of those that's faulty, your system may start doing all sorts of strange things. Um, it was easy, you know, to, as it was in the previous video, to swap out, swap out these, swap these round here, uh, just so I could move what, the functionality here into this area of the controller, the realm of the controller. But the controllers work fine, which shows that on this particular board, um, I don't think these are an issue at all. I think with this board, right from the start, it is uh, perhaps sort of questionable Z80. It's got a, a new Z80 on there, and I'm, you know, you've seen how it's behaving. Um, and the SM1. The SM1 ultimately was faulty. Um, in fact, I don't think it was actually. I think the SM1 on this board was okay. That went onto the other board because that had a faulty SM1. So I still haven't finished tidying these wires up from the uh, prior video where I did the work on the BIOS there. I'll do that at some point in future. I can't help but wonder if that's something to do with it, the length of them and the fact they're running next to each other and over each other. And uh, I doubt it. I seriously doubt it. But it's, uh, yeah, I guess there's a small possibility there. Uh, but I will tidy that up. But at the end of the day, this was a scrap board, an absolute junk scrap board. You know, you saw the damage that had been done there, uh, needing these wires and things. So I thought I would explore the reset side of things. If we just switch this on, see if we get sound or not. Hopefully we will. No. So just exploring the reset side of things, you can hear we've got sound there. It took me a few switch off, uh, switch ons and switch offs to get sound there, but that's okay. Now, what I've done is I'll show you in a sec. I've wired up um, to the reset circuit underneath. There's a little PST for something, I can't remember. Them. I'll have a look at that in a sec, but there's a, a little uh, three pin device there responsible for the reset. Uh, and it has three connections. You've got VCC ground and then V out. And the V out is the reset line. But you can hear that's working, it's working fine. And now, like I say, I've got a wire connected to that, and if I just ground that wire, that will reset the system. There we go. So we've just invoked a hard reset. Uh, now, just listen. The sound will. Oh, it's not doing. Now, when I did that previously, it worked okay for a, a quite a number of resets, actually. So it would seem to suggest that. Um, Reset in general is where it occurs. It isn't just a soft reset where you, you know, use the universe there to do soft reset, select and start, and then do soft reset. There you go, you see. So just resetting that, I managed to get it working. That was with a hard reset. So it's very strange. So I was just shorting this wire here to ground to get a reset pulse. And on the other side, you can see there, it's soldered to pin three of that little three pin component there. It's a PST7044, I think it is. Yeah, you can just about see, uh, yeah, you can just about see the part number there actually. So I think those are manufactured by Mitsumi uh, and it is just the, you know, what's used to generate the reset pulse there. So the question is, what is the relationship to the reset? Uh, now I think, if memory serves, pin 15 is the reset. Um, I need to check that in a minute. Um, 
I need to check the pin out of the 68,000. Uh, you can see I haven't finished tidying this up. I'm going to replace those wires. Uh, that is that part of the problem? I did wonder that. But the fact that with a number of resets you can get it working and it stays working for the entirety of your gameplay session there. It's only when you reset it again you get the issue. Suggests to me that it's something connected to the reset that is perhaps not resetting properly. So there's going to be a number of things. I would think either Neo IO here is going to have a relationship to the reset. The D0. The D0 has probably got a relationship to the reset. Maybe the reset on its own is not the thing. Maybe it is clock edges. Maybe we're getting some misaligned clock edges or something with the different clocks there and you reset it and it may or may not be absolutely perfect I don't know so yeah the D0 is one thought the YM2610 and the Z80 although the Z80 has been swapped so we can rule that out we know the RAM's alright because I've swapped the RAM from the other board and know the RAM was not an issue it's not got an SM1 it's not got an SM1 so you can rule that out this has got the new uh, military grade uh, 273's here the buff chips have been swapped around so that's going to have no relationship anyway and the fact the reset seems to have an issue these aren't connected to reset you know they obviously they will be reset as part of the whatever else you know resets in the system but they're not reset as such there's no specific reset connection to those um, the only other things really is that the YM2610 maybe something in there is not being completely reset on every reset um, you know the reset internal reset circuitry is a bit glitchy maybe um, I mean the other obvious thing is obviously other chips and things larger chips and things on here they're going to connect to reset but would they specifically cause an issue with the Z80 I don't think so actually so this one is uh, another mysterious one actually uh, I thought that last one was a repair from hell actually this one is uh, turned into a repair from hell as well and I believe on all these boards you can disable the watchdog actually there's usually a jumper that might be it, it does say WD you can sort of short that or open it to you know to enable or disable the watchdog so uh, yeah that can be useful because if you're getting the watchdog kicking in it's, it keeps resetting the system so if you're trying to take measurements with a logic analyzer or something or a scope or whatever trying to check some of the pins to see what's going on if it's resetting very frequently you know that's going to cause you all sorts of issues so yeah disabling that would be uh, advantageous uh, and I kind of cut myself off when I was talking about watchdogs in general uh, being in safety critical systems. Yeah, you know, you, the last thing you want in anything to do with like the medical or avionics industry is uh, some code glitching in some way that the system just locks up or you know crashes completely. Um, you want things to be functioning as much as possible. So some where some system whereby it can re reboot it and reset it and then everything may work because it might just be in a little glitch you know even with a hardware fault you imagine you've got a, a glitch let's say there's a, a problem occurs in this RAM here at a specific location um, it might be intermittent um, and a system that's intermittent maybe that you know maybe it doesn't work for a, a few seconds and then it's alright for a number of minutes that's better than nothing so resetting the system so it starts working again uh, you know, if it's controlling your, uh, I don't know, flaps or something on a plane or something like that, um, the last thing you want is it not working at all. Something that comes back on and gives you control for a few minutes until it glitches again and resets itself is better than nothing. Uh, and that's <clears throat> so that's primarily why you get watchdogs. So it's probably not related, but I thought I'll follow the reset uh, signal um, to all its destinations. I can't find any issues there, but I followed it all the way uh, down here. Actually, it's mysterious. So it comes up out one of the little vias here, goes through a via to the underside, which goes to I think the GRC chip, uh, and then I lost track of it. I was like, where on earth does it go? Well, it goes to these. Uh, you can measure from here, you know, the output uh, to these resistors here. It goes to this one here, it's a 22k, which then goes to one of the pins on the bridge here, which goes to the cart. So yeah, you've got a 22k uh, resistor there to uh, feed the reset to your cart. Uh, and then the pad up here, where this resistor is fed, uh, goes down to this re resistor here, 100 ohms, and then into here, I think. And this is a cap. Uh, you can see it there. Just remove the glue from it. And I don't think it's got any relevance, but since the reset does seem associated with this, i.e., you know, um, one thing I found is in the, if you try to do a soft reset in the Unibars, when, you, when you've got sound, you can't get sound back again. You can soft reboot it till the cows come home and you won't get sound again. Um, but when I had that hard reset, 
you know a long reset for a second or so let go yeah you may get sound you may not get sound but if you just like, do that a couple of times more often than not you get the sound back again so I can't help but wonder if the reset pulse is not long enough or something like that or maybe it's too long I don't know um, so I think I'm going to swap that cap out actually uh, just to rule it out uh, I don't think it's going to be relevant but let's just do it anyway yeah I'll just clean that up and we'll give it a try well whilst it's working that didn't actually solve it I'll show you if I uh, just reset this I'll hit the, grip, the contact now there we go and the chances are we're not going to have sound um, it did strike me though that if I could oh it did we've got sound Try and reset it again. It did uh, strike me that if we could work out, um, find a signal that's not right, in theory I could uh, put my own little watchdog circuit there actually to reset the system when you first power it on, if we're not getting the expected behaviour with whatever it is, I'm not sure. I just want to show you that I have actually got considerably far into the games and stuff, you know, you don't lose the sound, there's no issues, it's very strange. Oh yes, fault diagnosed. This is the working board without the SM1 now. And you'll see, we've got sound there. We've exactly the same behavior. We get exactly the same errors uh, regards to the SM1 um, in the diagnostic, we've got sound there. I bet you we haven't got sound in a sec. Because I switched this off and on about 20, there you go, off and on 20 times to get sound. So it's exactly the same behavior. The interesting thing there is I can't help but wonder what's going on. I'm wondering if it's somehow, in some situations, managing to latch the M1 on the cart before it's uh, caused an issue or something like that. Like the M1's remained latched from the previous power on or something. There we go. On the cart itself. So it's, you know, if you think about it, the Z8 is addressing the one on the, the cart rather than the one on the board that's not there. So, you know, the other thing that I can't help but wonder is if there were pull-ups or pull-downs on the data bus when that ROM the you know the, the, the SM1 that's not there is addressed that might be something to do with it we might be getting some garbage there which is why on some instances it works some it doesn't I, I, I'm just wondering if adding a pull-up or pull-down uh, pack on the data bus to the Z80 there just weak would maybe solve it when there's no SM1 it could be something as simple as that, like it's expecting the SM1 to be there, it's doing its normal thing, um, even with the unibars, and you're getting garbage. Sometimes, you know, there's more chance of it booting than others, depending on what it's reading, there we go. Could be something like that, but yeah, the fact that we're seeing exactly the same behaviour, uh, I think what I'll do, just to give me some confidence, I'm going to put that SM1 now onto the board we've been looking at, to see if that then brings that back to life 100% with regards to reliability of uh, you know power ons, power offs, and getting sound every time. So now we saw the exact same behaviour on the uh, the good board. This is the one that I'm going to fix the wires on in a minute that you saw in a previous video. You know the main board we've been looking at just now. Uh, it's got the SM1 on the good one. Let's now give this a try. It looks crooked, but it's not. It's the print again. The print, you know, the labels are not all straight on these. Well, we got sound right from the start there. Let's turn it up a touch. And I'll switch it off, switch it on, fingers crossed, um, and I'll run the diagnostics, then run diagnostics in a minute. But I suspect that's all it is. Yeah, there we go. Got sound. So, yeah, interesting. Uh, I do like what we've learned about this, actually, because in theory, uh, as I say, you, you know, I said earlier on, you can run these without the M1, um, uh, the SM1, not the M1, the M1, you know, the SM1. Think of the SM1, the S is the system M1. SM1. Uh, you see, so you can run these without the system M1, the SM1. Uh, and I think you perhaps need to do a mod. I suspect a pull up or a pull, perhaps a pull down, uh, maybe 10k or 22k on the Z80 data bus. And I reckon it would boot every single time. I might just try that on the other board. But before I do that, I think I'm going to order uh, an SMD resistor pack because trying to fit a dip resistor pack somewhere on the underside of that board and wiring up to the Z80 data bus connections isn't going to be the easiest thing to do but with a little SMD one with a few you know seven or eight bits of KNR 
uh, I can maybe hot glue it on the underneath. I suspect that would work actually. Um, so I'm going to give that a try, but as you can see, it works every single time. So let's now try the diagnostics uh, ROM. So hold down D, select and start. Oh yes, fixed. Now the interesting thing here, um, I'm pretty sure there was a Z80 error before the SM1 come off, came off this board. Uh, I could be wrong. I mean that would mean that there was nothing ever wrong with this board. But what I was going to say, one of the things I was going to point out, is those NeoBuff chips, swapping them around from one position to another in certain places, you can actually utilise what was faulty in one position in another position and it will work okay, depending on the, whether it's bi-directional, whether you've got an intermittent problem with it or whatever. Because the one that's in the GA11 position was the one that was in the Z80 spot on the other board, um, which we fixed in a previous video. And on this board, that GA11 position, I know, because what I did is I lifted the upper uh, data bit there that was connected to the Z80. Um, I forget which one it was, D7, I think it was. Uh, sorry, A yeah. In terms of the actual chip, I think it was like A7 and B7 on that GA11. I'll show you in a sec. And I lifted them just to see what happened without any connectivity and it won't boot a car. But when they're soldered back down, it works. And that was the bit that was causing the problem with the Z80 on the other board. So I do suspect, it's like I say, it's a directional thing. Um, in the instance where it's used in the GA11 position, it's uh, perhaps, for some reason, it's not an issue. Maybe it's enabled all the time, uh, because I do know you can bypass that uh, chip at GA, like GA, uh, G11, GA11, is it? Um, and GA11 can be completely bypassed with wires. Um, and I had a go at that as well. Whilst I had the pins lifted on GA11, I bypassed that one pin. Didn't make a difference, the system still worked, uh, but I ended up just soldering them, them back down again. Yeah, you might be able to see there, that pin didn't go down as flat as I would like, and that was a consequence of having lifted uh, the pin up on that side and the one that passes through on the other side, just to rule it out. Um, and I wanted to see what part of the circuit that was relevant to, which is why initially I just lifted them and then tested it without that connected, and it won't boot a game. So I'm guessing the uh, P, you know, program um, data connections go through here. And coming back to what I was talking about, how you can use some of these faulty ones in certain places, that one there is a good example. The controller inputs are running through here. You've got 16 uh, channels, if you like, there, 16 connections. And if you count up the directions, you know, of up, down, left, right, select, start, A, B, C, D, for both players, I think you get some like 20. Uh, so you've got 16 and 16. So this one here, there's only something like four or so connections are going through there up some of the through some of the bits and the others are just not used so you know 75 percent of that chip is not utilized so depending on where bits are faulty on one say the, the faulty in the uh, let's say the, the upper the upper um block you know sort of a, a, a8 onwards b8 onwards in one of these chips you could just swap this one around and everything would work because they're probably not used. Those bits are not used in this chip at all. So, you know, you could, those faulty bits, the faulty channels could be quite happily coexisting here. Um, and then you've got a decent one there. Do you see what I mean? So a little bit of juggling with these, if you think about it and look at where your faults are and what the other chips are doing, you can actually uh, utilize uh, some of them in other places. That probably isn't the case with this one up here, because that's going to be, uh, if it's used the data bus, you've probably got all 16 connections going through there, and it may well be the same with this one down here. But that one there is a good example of where all the bits, you know, all the channels are not utilized. And, and the other thing I was trying to get across is, these are bi-directional, you know, so you can have transfer from A to B or B to A, and it may well be that on some of these, direction, the direction only goes one way, you know, i.e. the CPU only wants to maybe write out to the data bus, maybe it doesn't want to read back, depending on what it is you know, you're dealing with here. I mean, you could argue that the controllers are a good example of that. Whilst SNK specified, I think on some of the systems, the CD, where you could write out to the controller ports, these probably only need to go one way. All we need to do is read in from the controller. There's no reason to go the other way. So if you had a fault in one direction, again, swapping the chips around could solve that. So now we've solved the sound problem, I'm going to tidy up these wires, and as I mentioned in the previous video, these were just temporary, because they were just off-cuts, bits I had left. Uh, since then, I've got some brand new k -Nar. When I first got this, I looked underneath, and I was under the, I don't know why, I was under the assumption there were no wires, but you can see them all here, very clearly where my thumb is. 
little strips of wires there go into all the connections on the CPU so we don't need any wires on the top side we can just have them on the underside and they'll look a lot, it'll look a lot tidier um, but the benefit I've got now is because this is all connected up it's very easy once I've done that to just measure on continuity from the relevant pins on here on the ROM to here and as soon as I find a short I know I found the right wire so I can just you know route a wire underneath here um, really easily um, it will look a lot better having wires on the top side of the board like that is never good what I was going to do is you know just cut new pieces and strip you know have them nice and tidy flat on the board and you know put them right next to each other and put a few little bobs blobs of hot glue to hold them down but uh, yeah I can't be bothered with that to be honest and I don't really see any points you know you could do if you're going to do something professionally to sell it uh, but this is just going to remain as one of my spare boards um, so yeah I'm just going to go with wires direct wires underneath as short as possible and you can see why it's super easy now. I know that the fourth pin up here needs uh, a uh, wire. It's got a wire at the moment, which, you know, obviously this is working. But if we probe along these points here, see we've got short. So I know if I just scratch the surface of that fourth little wire there, I just need a wire across there and I can remove the one on the top side. And as I do each one, I'll just going to re remove them here, and I can clean up around the CPU with some uh, flux uh, when I'm done. Yeah, that's that one off there. Uh, and the same with the underneath of the chip here, you know, I can just get a bit of flux under there and just tidy up the connections. I'll just check that one's still in place, you know, connectivity-wise, and then we'll move on to the next one. And there you go, you can see the first one there. Uh, now the nice thing is with this, you can just uh, literally touch the end of the wire with the soldering iron and the, the covering there just melts back very slowly a little bit. So, you know, I've just joined on the smallest point possible on the wire, as you can see. I'll clean up with uh, some IPA in a minute. And then just cut it off so it's just the right size. And again, just heat the end of the wire with the, the solder. Uh, and it melts and it's joined. You know, good join there. So yeah, you know, that's um, a bit tight. But that's what you want, you just want direct wires as short as possible. It will look a lot better when I'm done. So that Neo buff chip we swapped out in the previous video, um, I wanted to just test, um, because I'm thinking, you know, it's bi-directional, so it's working when it's reading from the ROM, but not when it's writing. And I thought, well, what better way to test it than with the Neo SD? Because I'm guessing that the uh, way that's going to work is that CPU various points is going to be right into the cards, right into something somewhere uh, to get various uh, things to happen. And this is the card boot, and you can see it loads again fine. But if we hold down A, C, and start, you will see. Hang on. Yeah, if we hold down the button combination there to get into the menu, because it's just resetting, you can't get into the menu at all. I had uh, King of Fighters 2K13 on here before, I think, and it wouldn't go into the menu at all. Let's see if we can get in there. Look, black screen. Yeah. So I think this is that upper data bit fault on the Neo buff there from the previous uh, video. So what I'm going to do is lift that pin, uh, just bridge it, because you can bridge uh, on the GA11 uh, Neo buff, as you'll see in a minute. You can just bridge it. We'll test that, see if that works. Hopefully that'll fix it. Yeah, so I've got this set in one direction at the moment, um, and the pins along the bottom here are all B. Now bear in mind the upper and the higher directions are set the same, they're set to high at the moment. The output enables are both enabled for the upper and lower. So we should see the same behavior on the upper and lower. Uh, so if we look at the, the uh, lower B ones first, I think this is like B3, there's nothing, high impedance, high impedance, high impedance. We've got two pins missing, then we've got a ground, and then these are the upper B pins. Look, we've got lows. And we go along here, uh, that one's all right, that one's high impedance, that one's high impedance. So we've got like three there that are outputting a low when they shouldn't be doing. Um, and it's the same as you go around, we see one or two highs, a few lows, it's just the issues with this particular NeoBuff chip um, are numerous. Um, now this is the one that was in the controller area on the previous board actually, but I suspect it's only in one direction. Uh, and I can't help but wonder if when these were tested at the factory, depending on 
if it failed in one direction, if that was the direction that was okay with the controller port, they may well have stuck it on the board. Uh, I am wondering that actually, because I just find it hard to believe. Because I'm sure the controls are working actually. I suspect it's it's in the other direction. It's you know reading the bits from the controller port are okay. As soon as you go the other way, you've got a problem. Uh, I could be wrong. Um, but that's how it seems. So in any case, I'm not going to continue uh, with this particular chip now. Uh, I'll just keep this uh, maybe for spares or something. I don't think I'd ever, ever use it, to be honest, because it looks like it's got intermittent failures all the way around it. Uh, and I'm just going to bypass it on the board there. So measuring around, uh, originally what I'd intended to do was use the wires somewhere around here for the Z80 underneath, you know, put a little SMD um, resistor arrays. Now I've ordered some SMD ones, these are dip obviously, um, but in the meantime I thought actually thinking about this it might be easier just to mount it on here. The 6116 DRAM here, um, I forget which ones it is, I think it's the t five pins at the top here, part of the data bus, you've got five connections there and there's three uh, down on this side here. So what we can do is overhang it like that, uh, in fact it's going to be, yeah, it's going to be a bit fiddly actually. Uh, I was going to say overhang it on the side where there's five. Uh, we could still do that. I can just bend the wires up. Yeah, if I let me think about this. Where's the ground? Yeah, if we solder it like that, there, so that five pins are soldered on. Lift three up and have three short wires coming across to the other three. In theory, uh, that might work. So we'll give that a try. So we've had the Neo Guff on the previous board, this is the Neo Duff. Um, I'll show you a, a closer up of a, a better mod than this actually. You can get a little PCB, well it seems like someone's created a little PCB, you could create one yourself, I could create one I guess. Um, I don't want to go in any closer than this, it doesn't look particularly great. You can see I've got four wires there joined across and a few across the bottom here joined and a few across the top joined and then some in the middle missing. And there's a reason for that. Um, when I was trying to lift the pins to it determine, you know, to fix the individual gates on there, by the time I got to like the third one, you know, I had a 244 on here, and I got to like the third one, and I thought, this is getting ridiculous, there's a number of these faulty. And at that point, we had a pad on this side started sliding around, I thought, oh god. And this is what you get if you try and start lifting individual pins using a solder iron rather than hot air. You can get that, you know, just from lifting one or two, a couple of times, that's it. You start getting pads moving around. If you use uh, hot air to remove the chip, work on the chip off the board, you won't have that problem. But the, these boards, with these thin pads here, they can come off super easy. So I did eventually lose a pad over there, a pad over here, and the single pad up there, actually, after I finally removed the chip the second time. So... There's no real damage, well there is obviously a couple of pads missing but uh, as you can see I did some of the, as you can see I did the remaining wires on the underside and I did them from wire to wire. So that's what you can do. At one point I did go on the top side from wire to wire, you can see some of these up here are tinned and I was going like from one wire here to one over there and it was like a spaghetti junction absolute nightmare. Um, and I got sort of three quarters way through that, in fact I got to the end of it actually, and I had a problem, it was watchdogging, so somewhere I had a short, and I spent ages looking through it, trying to work it out, at that point I removed all the ones on the top side, kept you know testing at each point, removing a wire, testing it, removing a wire, testing it, eventually the watchdog stopped, so I knew it was one of the ones on the top side, and that was why I then ended up with these ones here on the top side, I thought I'll just do the other ones on the top side, like that's point to point. But the reason I was trying to avoid doing them on the pads here is you just get an awful join, the solder flows around and you, you you know it's hard to get your wires cut exactly the same length but yeah you know from a distance it doesn't look too bad aside from the fact we're missing a, a couple of pads there. So all we've done there is effectively a bypass you know the inputs are going straight to the outputs each A connection is going straight to a B connection. So I guess you could argue I'm as much of a muppet for damaging that as the person that uh, wrenched the original ROM off here. Um, so you can see the underside there where all those wires were relocated. So yeah, most of them are fairly optimal. There's a few with a bit of slack in. I was trying to not get them too close to each other so they're not running in parallel and stuff. You know, overlapping and stuff's not so much of a problem. But when they run right side by side, that's where you can start to get problems. And again, it's the length. You want to keep them as short as possible. Um, you can see uh, in the previous video we had a bit of a bodge there, you know, there was a trace, uh, a pad going to a trace, and I just used a single strand, can you see that? A single strand of that coil wire there to join that back up. 
uh, and I did the same thing down here can you see that I sold from this pin and I run, ran the coil wire right up on top of the trace and just joined it on there so yeah it's looking a lot better than it was in the previous video for sure uh, and I think in general you know if you look at the board as a whole it's come out pretty good actually you know it's this is about a bit here would be perfect had I not damaged the, the couple of pads there actually um, but again it's just a learning experience that's the first time I've done one of those bypasses there um, and it is all working I'll show you now the main thing is and the main reason I went down this road of doing this bypass is, as you saw earlier that chip was doing all sorts of weird and wonderful things we didn't just have a few highs and lows outputting randomly on different pins um, it seemed like the A bank was doing different things to the B bank when it was on the other board in this position here that was why it wasn't causing a problem you know the, the direction coming this way whichever direction that was set to you know the direction coming this way into the 68k wasn't an issue but going back was the position here is bi-directional you know so you've got data coming from the car and to the car in theory because it's on the program bus you know you would think well all you're ever going to do is read from the program ROM and that's why for the most part it works but as soon as you do something like load the 161 in one or the Neo SD uh, you were getting weird and wonderful things with the 161 in one you could hold down start to go back to the menu and 50% of the time the menu wouldn't come back up it just black screen um, whilst the cart would actually boot so I found that a bit odd but I'm sure that was because of the bi-directional nature of that uh, you know the, the neo buff that goes there and it was only working in one direction and it was exactly the same thing with the neo sd but i'll show you now it's working 100 percent perfectly um no sound issues no problems with the neo sd no problems with the 161 and one so we'll connect this up again uh, i really should have it on an esd mark uh, paper is not the best thing to use so i'll put the uh, cart harness on there and that's because to a degree i was getting some sort of unreliability actually with the uh, cars sagging you know because they sag like that downwards and if you hold them upwards when it's in there it's all right it's a bit of a pain with the super gun because i have to keep disconnecting the super gun in order to uh, put a cart in but we'll try with the 161 and one first and you should see it going back to the menu there yeah that's a good sign yeah the neo geo logo was all over the place when it was loose you know the uh, slot there so let's uh let's try some metal slug three So you can hear we've got sound, no problems at all. And if I hold down start, this is where on the 161 in one wasn't going back to the menu properly. You'd get a black screen. Yeah, it would do this bit and then the screen would just go black, stick there. Whereas now it's working every time. So that's an interesting side note actually. If you get a 1611 and you've got that problem with your system um, and you've always wondered whether there's something wrong with your car, actually it's going to be the Neo Buff chip. If you've got um, an MV1A like this or a 1AX uh, or any of those systems that's got a Neo Buff on the program interface, that's going to be your problem. I'll just try another one just to be sure. Uh, and then we'll have a quick look at the Neo SD, that should do the same, that should work. Oh yes, cool game this. So let's hold down start again. Hopefully we should get back to the menu. Yep, I'd call that success. So we'll just try the Neo SD. So I've got the Neo SD in there now. Let's uh, get the menu up. Now this is what wasn't working. When you held down, the, the game was working like this, the last game that was programmed. But when you held down A, C and start to get back to the menu, that, that was not happening. It would uh, reset the car every single time. Uh, I suspect it was having a problem right into the cart. Uh, you might think, why? Why would you write to a car? Well, it's a, it's a way of communicating. If, the, uh, if you write out specific uh, places you shouldn't be able to write to in theory, uh, if you've got some uh, way of uh, you know, monitoring that on the car itself, you could do some clever things. 
and I suspect that's exactly what they've done. So again, it's a similar thing that if you've got Neo SD and you have a problem on some of your systems getting into the menu at all, you know, uh, that's going to be the problem. So let's program something up. You saw NAM was on there uh, and that was working. Uh, let's try something else fairly small. In fact, we'll just go for Shop Troopers. It's going to take you a few minutes, but I'll skip the uh, program in here for you. Sweet. Oh yes, love this game. It's like a Carly Warriors on steroids. There we go. Anyway, let's uh, hold down A, B, uh, sorry, A, C, A, D and start. Did I say A, C and start for you? Yeah, A, D and start is what I've selected. And then we're back to the menu. So yeah, it's working perfectly. So just before we close this video up now, I'll just uh, swap out the uh, YM2610. I just want to sh show you, uh, you need to be super careful with these because the pins are really fiddly to work with with these uh, uh, turn pin uh, shrink dip sockets. Uh, so this is the original one, you can see, can you see it was a bit uh, corroded on one side but the other side was good as new. So I'm going to put in that uh, glitchy one with the uh, FM issue, just so you can hear it. Uh, and you can see this was, uh, and you can see the, the reclaimed, as I mentioned in the previous video, um, I put a big cross across that. But the pins were bent all over the place uh, and it was very, very difficult to straighten out. And you want to try and do one side uh, at a time. Try and get one side in, like yeah, I can tell that back side's in firmly, uh, and then it's a case of manipulating it and moving it around until you feel like all the pins are in the right spot. And occasionally, you'll find with these, you've got to keep taking it out, putting it back in, trying the, the other side first, then swapping back to the other side, you know, like alternating from side to side, because these are super hard to get in. Getting the pins aligned is really difficult. Like I say, that side's in now, but then the back side's not. Oh, it is, there we go. Uh, and then before you commit, just look down the profile, just to make sure you're in. Uh, and just push it in, and it should go in oh, bit by bit like that, that's it, that's in. Uh, but they're, yeah, they're hard to get in. So I've got to hope it doesn't uh, create me any pro problem testing this. Let's, uh, let's just try and not just look. Can you hear that? Sounds like there's no sound. Oh, hang on a minute, there is no sound. We've not got the SM1. <laughs> Let's try it again, hang on. Yeah, this is the difficulty now. I was trying to test it in such a way that I actually get sound. Right, so hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Can you hear that? It's very quiet. So it's super hard to demonstrate this sound problem. Just listen. If I put a credit in, just listen super carefully. I'll move the speaker nearer. Just listen. Can you hear the credit noise? Yeah, it's like the credit noise is super quiet. I mean, like mega quiet. There's definitely a volume level thing going on there. So. Um, that was why I thought there was a problem with the FM, but I think it's using the FM now. So maybe not. Maybe there's uh, a problem somewhere else in there. Just with one channel, maybe. I'm, I guess there's multiple channels to each of the different sound components within it. So that concludes my MVS repairs for the moment. I did. I thought I had another box with another three or four of these somewhere. I can't find it. Um, yeah, so there might be uh, a video in future. If not, I'll just get some more of these boards to look at at some point, I think. Uh, but yeah, that makes 100% success right now. Uh, bear in mind, this board is missing an SM1. So in order to test the sound on this, I do have to switch off and on, off and on, off and on until the sound works. Um, so yeah, we may revisit if I can work out a solution to that actually. Thinking things through, the Z80 is going to have a reset vector. If this ROM's here, obviously it's going to hit that, and then you can have no problems. If that's not there, I would, I would have assumed that the one on the cart is connected to this at that point. But it may well be that as part of the boot process, it tries to point it to the SM1, even with the Unibar C, with the hardware test disabled. And that's where things go sort of crazy. So, I don't know, I might have a word with the Raz to see what his uh, understanding is of how that works. Because it'd be nice if there was a way to uh, just skip the SM1, 
check, you know, if the hardware check's disabled, maybe just go straight to the car, because if it did that, I suspect it wouldn't have a problem. I, think, I suspect it would work. So I've managed to get it working without an SM1. I'll show you what's required in a minute. If we just test with the diagnostics. So I've got the M1 diag in, so now if I hold down select and start to reset, we get that because the SM1's not there. Start to continue. All tests passed. So for all intents and purposes, it behaves a bit like uh, the 1C. I'm guessing, uh, and I could be incorrect, but I'm guessing it might in theory be possible to put an MV1C official BIOS on here now and it would work just like an MV1C. I don't know, I've ordered some 27C1024s, I'll perhaps report back on that in another video. Um, but the key is, is, if you skip past the SM1 error there, you can see it does all test pass, the communication channel is working fine. So you can see how I did that there, I removed the 1K pull up that goes to the weight line here. Uh, and on the right hand side uh, just run a trace down to this via here and that via connects to the chip enable on the SM1. If you flip the board over it's pin 22 here, there's a, a via there on the output enable on the top of the output enable pin and it's uh, skip one, one to the right, you know two to the right of that uh, and it's via goes down here somewhere, I think that's the one we were looking at on the underside. So if we just do some testing now, bear in mind I've tested with loads of original cars including the ones that have that additional M1 check so I'm talking about things like King of Fights 2000, uh, uh, what's the other one, Metal Slug 5, etc. And they'll work fine, no issues at all. But the benefits of just quickly plugging this in, I can just quickly jump in and out of a number of games here and determine whether it's working properly or not. But as you can hear, we've got sound. Now previously, if I do a soft reboot, we would lose sound. But I guarantee now that uh, we have sound still. As you can hear, sweet. Let's try something else. Apologies if it's a little bit too loud. It's going to vary from game to game. One thing I've found with the Neo Geo is uh, you know the volume levels between games varies a little bit. So let's try something uh, you've not seen before. Let's try Mark of the Wolves. Sweet. Oh. See, previously we'd have lost the sound already, you know, just from a single soft reboot. You lose it. Strikers, I think. I think Strikers is one of the games that has that MV1 check in it actually, so it's a, a valid test really. Um, incidentally, if you're getting crackly sound on a 161 in one, uh, you might want to check out some of my other videos. The mod I did there to add a couple of 47 Pikafar caps uh, fixes that. Uh, where's it gone now? I really wish they put these games in alphabetical order, I can never find anything when I'm trying to find it. I mean, whilst I primarily use the Neo SD, the 161 in one does have its uses. Just show you, just so you can see. I'm using, you know, the board without the SM1. We'll plug King of uh, Monsters in, switch it on. So you no problem there. Switch it off and on. Hang on. Switch it off. Switch it on. Switch it off and on too quick. There, it's still charged. But as you can hear, it works every time. No problems at all. Sweet. 
So all that mod's doing is keeping the Z80 in a wait state, you know, in a kind of like on hold, sort of sat there doing nothing, it's not processing, it's waiting to be enabled, if you like, uh, via the wait pin there. Um, and because the chip enable pin here, that would normally, you know, that would goes active, it's low, active low, and that wait pin's active low. So we'll have a low on that chip enable pin when you first power one of these up, because it, you know, the system's enabling the SM1 so that the Z80 has got a reset vector from the SM1 to run its initial, well, its initialization code there. And at some point in the normal BIOS, there'll be a, a test, you know, it's in, I think uh, Perto was telling me, it writes an 01 and it should respond with 01, I think as part of that communications test there, that will the test via the communication channel. Um, so we, when we haven't got an SM1 there, the CPU's trying to boot from the SM1, it isn't there, that chip enables low, because it's trying to, you know, the system has enabled this device, the SM1, but because there's nothing there, the data bus is floating. Now you saw earlier, I tried a pull down, uh, array there. Uh, Furtex suggested the same thing because I think he was saying we'd get knobs effectively. Um, but the problem is the program counter increments, as Furtex was, uh, you know, he mentioned that as well, which is, you know, something I was aware of. So the program counter is going to increment with those knobs. It was the question was really is how on earth was it managing to boot from the M1 occasionally? You know, one out of every four or five boots, you would get it to work okay. Um, and the only thing I can take from that is maybe it was sometimes quicker than others at, trans at switching over between the M SM1 to the M1. It could be like the difference between one or two cycles or, you know, zero cycles, etc. Um, so you may find it varies from board to board. Some boards without an SM1, uh, without this mod, you may get no sound at all ever based on how uh, quick or slow the enable uh, signals are after it first powers up uh, and it might vary from board to the, from the different board uh, revisions as well actually that uh, transition time there you know it when it first powers up of actually enabling the SM1 there um, and switching over to the uh, M1 that's the important base how long it takes to switch over to the M1 after you sw first switch the power on but then after you get past that point you know when the system starts to boot a game one of the first things it's going to do is disable the uh, SM1 here and cut over to the M1 um, actually all we're doing is is tricking you know the active low uh, chip enable here when it's trying to enable the SM1 that low signal that's on the chip enable pin that's um, going to the wait pin here which is also active low which means the CPU is told to wait um, and it's, that's going to be right from boot right from power on that signal is going to be low so that's how it's working the Z80 is disabled up until the point that the M1 is in the right address space uh, at which point it just seems to work so yeah, that's sweet. Uh, so you could use that mod to bypass the SM1. You don't need an SM1 if you've got a Unibios. Bear in mind, if you enable the hardware test, it's going to come up with a Z80 error on the Unibios. But if you've got the hardware test disabled, it's just going to run as normal. Everything's going to work fine. In any case, I am pleased to have got these boards up and running. I do hope you found the video interesting. Thank you very much for watching. Please like, share and subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.